building, and he found permafrost on one of them. In Pukubeku, I forget, standing up here at the front of the room, he found it in many other places, but he had the temperature data to support it. He published a couple of places, he published in Nature, and I think it was a journal of geophysical research letters, or another, some other journal. Um, the, his results uh, from permafrost, finding permafrost on Mauna Kea. Um, since then, it's been out of interest but there, uh, to a lot of different people, um, including Dr. Yoshikawa. Uh, but we've never really done anything sort of comprehensive or uh, sort of looking at the bigger picture of permafrost that I'm aware of since that work in the late 60s and early 70s by Dr. Woodcock. So about, uh, I mean, I've only been with the Office of Mauna Kea Management for about two and a half, three years now, just like, just going on three years, and uh, shortly after I started, one of the things that was in the management plan for the for the university was to look at permafrost and the effects of climate change. Not necessarily connecting those two, but they were both in there. Um, we've also had a number of entities expressing interest in permafrost, including, I think, some of you or many of you in the room that have been expressed interest in it. Um, and so we have a project that we're supporting with uh, Dr. Norbert Schorkofer, who's a University of Hawaii and Manoa professor. Um, and one of the things that he did is brought in Dr. Yoshikawa to ask for some technical help with different facets of the project. The work that Dr. Schorkofer is leading, it looks at sort of overall temperature cycles using infrared photography, data loggers, mapping, um, and Kenji's, uh, Dr. Yoshikawa's uh, perspective, you know, has some technical expertise in those areas. Um, you know, help and so what Norbert is doing is looking at a broader picture of both the permafrost as well as its, as its applications to the biology and other natural resources. So, with that, um, Dr. Schorkhofer asked Dr. Yoshikawa to help uh, with. Some of the technical understanding of permafrost, as well as some of the geophysical mapping techniques, specifically DC resistivity mapping, which is to dumb it down to the level that I understand it. That way, at least, is to basically take a car battery and induce an electrical current in the ground and measure it along a cable at different intervals and see how the ground attenuates the or, or alters the electrical current in the ground. And from that, we can map a permafrost. Basically, just inducing a, a weak electrical uh, DC current into the ground. Um, Dr. Yoshikawa is originally from Tokyo, I remember. Uh, got his PhD in Okinawa. Hokkaido. Hokkaido, okay. Uh, but about 30 years ago, he sailed a boat. He got a sailboat and sailed from Okinawa. Was it from Okinawa? This is Hokkaido. From Hokkaido? They <laughs> <laughs> forget the Okinawa. <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing to do with it. He sailed from Hokkaido to Barrow, Alaska in the sailboat and started work looking at, uh, if I understand correctly, subsea, looking for subsea permafrost in the, uh, where would that be, in the Chukchi? Yeah, in the Beaufort Sea. In the Beaufort and the Chukchi Sea. So, uh, and since, ever since then he's been in Alaska in some one capacity or another. He is currently a professor with the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, if you are interested, uh, biography about them, Finding Mars by uh, Geophysical Institute, uh, forget his title, but the Geo uh, uh, Outreach uh, Faculty at uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks Geophysical Institute, Ned Roselle, writes a weekly column for the Alaska newspapers, but he also wrote a biography about Tenji and his, uh, much of his work called Finding Mars. And there's also a book called Permafrost in Our Time. Uh, this book is actually online, um, and Kenji will talk about some of the data that associated with it and how it's available. But the Permafrost in Our Time book is available online, and as well as in hard copy. Um, and with that, I think I've said more than enough, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Yoshikawa. And again, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Grace. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kenji Yoshikawa. I'm uh, from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Yeah, thank you very much, Fritz, and uh, very much, you know, you covered the introduction to my background. So then, I think I, one thing that I have to tell you about, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm originally from Japan, then uh, Japanese is my first language, so the English still, I want to 
Training as in the Yuvasvaraska, but still not perfect and also very strong accent, I believe. And it's something really hard to understand, just uh, anytime let me know, then I try to find the other one to explain about this. So then today's topic, maybe I want to talk about, uh, sorry, it's kind of so small, <laughs> if I can see it. Uh, tropical mountain permafrost. Yeah, I talk, talk about the tropical uh, mountain permafrost. The uh, research and the update, what's the uh, uh, current status of the uh, tropical permafrost, uh, mountain permafrost? That's what uh, I want to mainly talk about this. So then, before we talk about just a very briefly, uh, we are talking about the three, four sites today. Plus the Taiwan, and this is not tropical, the Taiwan talk about, uh, you know, also the extreme permafrost conditions. That, that's one of the uh, not the popular, like minor topic for permafrost community in the world, because, you know, today is mainly we are working with permafrost community, talk about Alaska, or Russia, Siberia, many places about uh, ice rich permafrost. How how the global warming to affect for the permafrost, about also carbon storage. These things is of course my major topics. Everybody focus on the Arctic region. So, but at the same time, of course, we we, we, we have some permafrost that not not the uh, typical permafrost region. We should uh, archive it. Then we should monitor this like. Uh, uh, Alfred Woodcock did in the 60s, 40 years ago. The same thing, so we should uh, uh, work on this. That's what uh, mainly you want to talk about. The same, same time, so, uh, another question is where is really the coldest uh, permafrost in our planet? That's past questions, uh, especially uh, extraterrestrial research is now more popular to go to Martian or Titan, the other. Uh, te Area has a more permafrost uh, presence of the permafrost over there. Then the, we, we like to see the analog study of the same time of, of the well, where is really the coldest place in the, our planet for our permafrost study. So that's one of the things we try to look for the uh, coldest place, which is the most uh, stable, maybe permafrost. Then the other part we want to talk about, maybe talk about the tropical mountain permafrost, which is very weak permafrost, just a little tiny impact, maybe permafrost completely disappear. That kind of weak conditions. We will not talk about the both of this, but maybe talk about this weak one today. The coldest one. So far, we work on the uh, Antarctic and the Alaska, the McKinney, the Denali. Then we find out so far the Denali is about minus 27 degrees C for the permafrost temperature, which is the coldest one so far found. Then we have another monitoring site on the Eswas Mountains in Antarctic. That's uh, not the cold as McKinley. So then I mean, still Alaska the coldest, but still we don't have a chance to uh, send the expedition to the, uh, the uh, being so much in the highest mountain in the Antarctic, maybe the cold is colder than uh, McKinley, but uh, still we don't, we don't know. But uh, anyways, uh, the range of the coldest temperature of the power cross is somewhere or something, minus 27, minus 30, that looks like our planet's minimum number. The maximum number, of course, zero, very close to warm temperature, zero degrees C. So then, maybe I want to talk about this foresight, in Hawaii and Mexico and Peru and the Kilimanjaro today. So then this is one uh, uh, of the sites. We this most of the sites we have a, a satellite-based uh, transmit system. I mean, we can see the real-time temperature by uh, region. And this is a uh, one of the sites for from uh, Matindi. Yeah, then maybe just quickly. I just look at, you know, just, just right now I access to this, for example, this is a, uh, this is a Kilimanjaro. So Kilimanjaro right now, current temperature is about uh, uh, minus 9, kind of cold air temperature. Then ground surface temperature is minus 10, that looks like. Then one of the important things for Kilimanjaro, later I will talk about this, but uh, you know, almost 365 times a day we have a freeze-thaw action. That's very impressive uh, 
conditions. So anyway, we, we are monitoring the EG you know, mountain for the satellite base. So then, before you kind of talk, talk to the uh, tropical mountain power plus, just uh, I need to really explain about the, in general concept of the permafrost and the, uh, the st thermal structure of the permafrost. As far as you know, the definition of the I think everybody already understands that uh, make sure that we are same definition. So permafrost is any mat ground material colder than zero, zero degrees, colder than zero degree C or what? Zero, or zero degree C. Uh, then, uh, Stay that situation more than two years. So then the, any material zero degree C or colder stay the more than two years we consider the permafrost. But sometimes the you know, material is a three years later thaw out. But still, you know that time it's more than two years we call the permafrost. Then except the glacier, glacier is you know zero degrees or colder, more than two years, but we don't call it permafrost. But uh, other than that, we very much uh, call permafrost. Then biggest uh, confusion, the more, many times in the, especially journalism, uh, we mistake in the today the warming, perm warming permafrost end up the uh, thawing permafrost. But many times maybe you hear about the melting permafrost. is not a good word for that because uh, permafrost is uh, most likely bedrock or soil or not necessary to be the ice. Any, any material can be the permafrost. Then that temperature, like uh, thermal state, change to the negative to positive. That's still material exists. That I means we don't say the melting. The thawing is a more pro proper word. Than, but many people misunderstand using melting permafrost by global warming. That such kind of word is mainly with people thinking about ice. I think of permafrost. Ice is part of this, but not everything. I mean, we still, our community, we like to use the throwing permafrost, not the melting permafrost. So then now, we, this one is just talking about uh, when we uh, uh, measuring temperature of permafrost, this is uh, about 70 degrees north <coughs> of Alaska, near the barrel. So then this is the x-axis temperature, y-axis uh, depth. Then this each line is every month. Then the whole year is 12 months, 12 line we just plotted. The simply uh, coldest months, like uh, this time the March, the minus 20 degree at the surface. They go into the deeper ground, going to warmer and warmer. Then warmest months, like July, at plus 5 degree C. Then going to the ground, going to colder, colder. Then we call it in this graph, about 10 meters below ground, is a zero annual amplitude temperature. So that we call about the permafrost temperature. Because, you know, you can see this is permafrost here, but uh, there is annual fluctuation. So we cannot say which degree of the temperature is. You move around. But uh, if here, zero annual amplitude temperature, we call that oh, this doesn't change it. I mean, for example, when night in Alaska, permafrost temperature is minus seven because this point. So that's a, a just usually we can talk about this. <coughs> so at the same time, you know, if it's a long term uh, monitoring, we can see that this point moves to the warming or cooling and doesn't change. That's we talk about the warming permafrost or cooling permafrost. So then another thing is that uh, this is very tricky. I even the mistake many times in the tropical area. Uh, left side, so you know, cut off. And the higher up is like uh, most of the Arctic area, summer uh, ground temperature regime, like something like this. We have permafrost underground. This is ground surface. Usually, uh, Arctic area we have a snow or some kind of vegetation near surface. Then atmosphere here. So then also the. Active layer. Active layer is a seasonally freeze thaw layer. The like winter time for pretty usually freeze, then summertime thaw up. Then below the active layer, we have permafrost. Then usually we may make temperature monitoring. There is a geothermal, then goes deeper and warmer. But the key is we have a thermal offset in the active layer here. So this what this meaning is, you know, 
summertime, simply summertime, throwing material is more lower thermal conductivity. They end up the heat doesn't penetrate much. So then winter time, thermal conductivity increase because water going to ice. Ice is much higher thermal conductivity. So they end up, end up the uh, heat can easy to penetrate. So that means the same material, but the free state and thawing state, different thermal conductivity, that makes this offset. So that's very commonly happening in this. That means that, for example, in the Alaska, south of Anchorage, usually, annual mean ground surface temperature plus three, sometimes plus four, but still we have a permafrost very stably. Sounds strange, you know, air temperature plus positive, but the underground is negative because of this summer offset maker in these situations. So that, that this happened, then also snow surface come up. Usually, uh, ground surface temperature and the air temperature has not the same. Air temperature is much colder than ground surface temperature. So that we call summer surface offset, made by usually snow or surface uh, organic materials made like this. So that, that thing, you know, usually between permafrost and the atmosphere, we have a thermal offset, there also surface offset. Two things that are happening that makes a little more complicated this. Then this is very much the typical permafrost area's uh, uh, concept and idea, but the tropical area is not the mark for this. That's a really tricky part because the uh, first is active layer is have to have a season. You have a, remember the winter time and summer time, different su summer conductivity. That made an offset. But uh, we don't have a season here. So that means we don't have a summer offset. So that means if you, this is tropical area, you can see the te temperature rising over the geothermal, the active layer is very little. Then you don't really have an offset. The soil go up this. And the no summer offset in the tropical area. Then, but there is a, a surface offset because, especially in the rainy season, you have a snow surface that makes a surface offset. That's a big difference, you know, like uh, tropical permafrost versus typical uh, polar region permafrost in the geothermal conditions. <coughs> That's statistic. So, that end up what happens is uh, tropical area, we have a lot of big daily fluctuations. But it doesn't penetrate, only 24 hours enough time for penetrate the temperature. So the surface has a huge variation, but the needle go down to the ground, no changing. So then seasonal variations, usually uh, for area the huge seasonal variation, but the tropical area, we don't have almost no seasonal variations. That's a big difference about compared to Alaska and uh, Hawaii. So then, uh, when you look at the tropical permafrost, uh, you know, we have to think about two patterns. One is uh, if we cover by snow, if no snow. The, what happens is the wet season, which is snow accumulates time, is usually you have a, almost straight up to the uh, temperature regime because the, uh, well, one thing is that we, we don't have a, a oh, Sorry, first thing is that <laughs> tropical area has very strong solar radiations, so then ground heating very uh, strongly. But at the same time, so usually tropical mountains, meaning high mountains, air is much thinner than here, so that, that meaning you don't have much sensible uh, heat go to the atmosphere. So that means that they catching a lot of heat in the ground surface, yeah? So that means that if there's no snow, you have a lot of ground heat in the surface, then just a little above the uh, ground surface is no sensitive heat, meaning very cold. That's very, very big gap happening here. Yeah? But uh, when, when you have a snow on the surface, uh, th thin, 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 thin thickness of the snow, you, you avoid this whole problem. Then uh, temperature regime is almost straight up. A little, little effect, but not too much effect for this. So that's Snow cover or not is a very important uh, parameter of this. So that's just sorry about the kind of long introduction. This is a you know big difference about typical permafrost area in the Arctic versus tropical permafrost area. It's a big difference about this. So that's simply like season difference and the atmosphere's condition difference.
So then now we're going to talk about uh, this area, like, uh, the, something you know, we're we going to say that uh, tropical meaning between the tropic Canta and the tropic, tropic, uh, Capricorn, between this area, so including Hawaii too. So then if, if we pick up the all high mountains in this area, you can see that this one, for example, uh, Mauna Kea, Mauna Loa, the Mexico has several high mountains, and the Andes is a lot of high mountains. Then also um, Kilimanjaro, Mount Kenya, Renzoi, Erinio has only 3,000 meters, some mountain here. Then also Kinabal and uh, Ilianjaya, the previous name is Kano Peak. So these mountains are high mountains, possibly to have a permafrost. Then uh, when we look at the absolute actual reality is, uh, I just marked the red, red one, how, how, the, how the permafrost be, or, or could be the permafrost today. So then blue one is most unlikely to have permafrost today. But of course, you know, when the LGM, we should have a permafrost is even blue as triangle too. Then for example, today you can, you can see that we quickly, this is Mount Kenya, uh, only 5,200 meters, but higher than Hawaii, but uh, uh, very close to the equator, then we don't have a pump cross here. And Lorenzo is 5,090 meters, and not even plus not high. Then this is a scan of the uh, uh, 4,700 meters. So this mountain is no permafrost, but uh, you know, sometimes you know, permafrost and the glaciers, you know, people think you're the same. If, if we have a glacier, it must be permafrost. It's not really true, right? The permafrost is a thermal condition. That would have to be the below zero degree C. But the glacier doesn't matter, you know, just a balance. More accumulation, more snow than the melting snow. We can have a glacier anywhere in that. That's precipitation balance. <laughs> so then, then we then, for the permafrost view, these mountains has so far we work on this and no permafrost is compound. So then another thing is that when we look at the solar radiation, of course solar radiation is very important for the tropical permafrost. And this is the uh, intensity of the uh, solar radiation. So of course when goes the northern latitude. So the uh, slope aspects is very important for the presence or absence of permafrost. But uh, even the tropical area, yes, like Hawaii or Peru is both you know, very close to the, uh, this area. So already you have a strong difference of the seasons. But uh, like Kilimanjaro is uh, almost zero at the equator, and you don't have no much slope aspect. That means that simply that uh, Kilimanjaro and the Hawaii is uh, similar, but the slightly different for the solar radiation aspect. They usually, when we go into the expansion for the, these tropical mountains, what we do, usually first is we try to do the, the understand the NAPS rate. So then we try to, uh, if possible, we just drill, start drilling from near sea level to go up to the mountain, put it at the then try to temperature. Remember temperature, tropical is kind of easy, like one meter below, seasonal uh, variation, almost nothing. Then daily variation doesn't need to that deep. I mean, uh, 50 or 1 meter deep is already very stable temperature we can get. We don't need to go much deeper. So then we can compare the plotting for the temperature versus altitude elevations. You can see some kind of a select curve. So for example, Mauna Kea case, you can see the graph distance. Actually, for the Mauna Kea, if you have a 5,000 meter high, we will have a stable ice, uh, permafrost on the Mauna Kea. But the Mauna Kea is only 4,200, so that means actually the, something really special situation. We could have a permafrost, but uh, otherwise, very difficult to have it. Then, for example, Peru and Mexico, again, say about 5,000, a little less than 5,000 meter, we can have a permafrost. Then, the reality is, we're looking for the permafrost on the Mexico and Peru. About uh, 5,000 meter is a uh, lower boundary of the power cross. For the Kilimanjaro, you get a little higher the lapse rate because the other three are about 15 to 20 degrees north and south, but Kilimanjaro is three degree, two degrees south, almost uh, equator. That's why Kilimanjaro is a little different than the other three. I mean, the more higher. 
So to this thing, you can see that about 6,000, close to the 6,000 meter, we will have a palm cross. So then now we are going to talk about the start from Peru. So this is the, we have, the, we have uh, three uh, monitoring stations in Peru. One is, the one of these is the Peru, the why? North of Peru, northern part of Peru or Ecuador, already ice capped. No uh, bedrock exposed. I mean, we, you cannot really do it about power cross work. Then when the south of Peru, this station is less, then you, you, you can have a bedrock and, and exposed on higher elevation that we can work on this. This is a mountain named Chachani. Chachani is about 6,030 meters high, about 20,000 feet. So then this point is 5,350. We are uh, doing here, this is a power cross, we have a power cross here. And this time we can see that. Uh, 5K generator lit up to here with 800 watt small drill because the high mountain air is spinner engine power is dramatically dropped down. And if you are using 1K drill, you need you, 1K generator is not enough power to operate. It has been a bigger engine for the thinner air. Mm. So then you can see the you know, one of the interesting things. I, I'm going to the next two weeks, going to Peru here again. Then next next week, main thing is we try to understand about the distribution of power flows. Then you can see the obvious here, huge albedo difference. Uh, albedo, see the white ash layer here as a power flows. The next of this is a darker color, the lower albedo is no power flows. Now in the solar radiation, the reflection is, seems very important for the case of Peru. And this is a grand surface temperature that day we measured about the albedo versus uh, surface temperature. You can see the kind of a linear relationship. So that we have simply the albedo is the kind of key to find out the permafrost locations. Now also, uh, Peru, or all, actually all, all of the tropical mountains, common thing is that usually, Tropical palm cross is high enough to have palm cross in there. How to make a high mountain? Most likely volcano. I mean, we are working with most of the tropical mountain is uh, volcanic origin. So I mean, at the same time, we have very high geothermal flow than normal. That, that's another thing so we have to really careful about uh, looking for the palm cross. Even the, like 6,000 meter high, but a very strong active volcano, we don't have a power cross. So this, this is, for example, uh, good things in Peru, we have both 6,000 meter high mountains next to each other. One is inactive, one is active volcano, the same height, one has a power cross, one has not. So that maybe you can see that, sorry, you don't have to see that this one, but uh, uh, you can see that uh, this is a uh, lower, this graph, uh, Grand air, tem uh, grand, uh, air temperature. Air temperature is like uh, 5 degrees C or something all year round, but uh, 80 centimeter, uh, 80 centimeter ground temperature is uh, like uh, 10, 20, 30 degrees C. Very hot. Just a little deep ground, very heat coming, of course, no power across these uh, mountains. And the geothermal flows is another. Uh, pro Issue to we have to think about the uh, presence of, or absence of permafrost. Then also that uh, this is kind of a little uh, minor topic of permafrost. Then uh, why we have to monitor the uh, tropical permafrost? I think that many reasons we can discuss about this, but I think I can point out two to today. So first one is is you see that like in case of Hawaii or many places. Uh, power cross is so critical, kind of boundary conditions now. Just a little impact, we may lose the power cross. Just a small impact, we, we develop the power cross. So that means that not always modeling work or everything, nice to see the boundary conditions target, right? In that case, we can see that uh, any situation changing, we can pick up. So that means, that, for example, in the middle of the Antarctic, power cross temperature is minus 20. Minus 20 to minus 90, it doesn't really matter, but this area is really critical. That, that's one of the reasons. 
The another reason, uh, not maybe, not too much in Hawaii, maybe a little related, but maybe the Kilimanjaro and Peru, most of the people live in the area as a water resources belong on the glacier water. Then the hydrological systems, we have to understand otherwise, you know, they, they lose the water resources. Then if we have a permafrost like uh, Kilimanjaro or Peru, usually most of the places are glacier, then glacier melt water goes to the groundwater system. Then this groundwater system going to the swing in the base of the mountain that people are using for agriculture or for living. But if we have a permafrost, what happens is permafrost is very much impermeable. They end up the, uh, most of the uh, glacier melt water go down off immediately to the surface water. There is not much contribution to the groundwater system. That's uh, kind of important for uh, the understand the mountain. That, that's why there are other reasons the uh, uh, Peruvian government, like Kilimanjaro, the parks are the interest about permafrost because the uh, main is hydrology. So that's uh, uh, things then. Now I'll talk about uh, Kilimanjaro, about three degrees south. We last five years, we go almost every year to so many places. One of the biggest Kilimanjaro difficulty is uh, still very active volcano. It's a very high heat pro, and most of the place is no permafrost because of very high heat, heat from the mountain. And you can see that uh, Kilimanjaro, this is a view from west to east, and now still you have a big glacier here, then this is the highest point. Then you can see that this uh, crater here, around the crater is very hot. Then Anyway, apart from Greta, you will have come across there. And then, Kilimanjaro, the air temperature is minus 6. That's kind of very cold. But uh, again, the <coughs> latitude is so low, so that means solar radiation so strong impact, and we heat up the ground. You see the area, so the satellite data over today, right? almost the ground surface temperature is 50 degrees C, the ground surface. But the air temperature is minus 10, something I use very easily because air to thin doesn't much uh, heat exchange from ground surface to air. So then the end up, the, you know, we have a, we drill down all the uh, summit areas looking for the permafrost, and what we found. So this is still a big glacier there, and then we, we found, you know, maybe you heard about the, Glacier is retreating a lot in Kilimanjaro today. So that's actually a big benefit for permafrost distribution. Because you know, when the glacier, the healthy glacier, the thick glacier, the air temperature is minus six, but they, they, they are very much the more than 10 meters thick of glacier, they go to the towing point. I mean the ground bottom of the glacier is almost zero degree C. So that means that you don't have a chance to develop the permafrost here, but the uh, glacier is going to sitting, sitting for the retreating uh, stage, still covered by the glacier, which is higher albedo, then solar radiation blocks the ground surface, then up the temperature distribution, something like this. So that, that means until zero degrees C hitting the point, we have a permafrost. Then after that, the glacier is completely disappear, but still, you know, you have a lot of ice rich uh, permafrost and, uh, underneath, and we, we can keep the period of the, uh, not too long, but temporarily we, we can have a permafrost like this. That is, we see the situation many times. Then this is, for example, you know, uh, this one of the paper, uh, we just copied, you know, what the bottom of temperature of the glacier, the tropical area, you can see that like Karapuna Peru that we are working on this, there was a Kilimanjaro. These are uh, bottom of the air temperature is, for example, uh, Kilimanjaro minus 7. The bottom of the glacier temperature minus 1.2. But you know, again, Sina glacier can cross to the minus 7 too. So that means it's cold enough to have a power frost in the Kilimanjaro or Karapuna Peru. And then depend on the uh, power. Glacier at uh, the bottom of the glacier temperature. So then, many times you know, in Kilimanjaro, we have a lot of uh, debris covered glaciers. You can see that temperature is colder than zero degrees C. But uh, 
in case of Kilimanjaro, it doesn't work well about the uh, albedo because, uh, you know, white ash layer on the Kilimanjaro is usually still very close to the uh, crater. So that means a very hot heat flow coming to the, uh, from the ground, then we don't have palm frost. Then this site is actually uh, we, we are transmitting today, right? But this, this one also, I miss it. They don't have palm frost here. I saw the near glacier. There are a lot of you know, cold conditions there, the thinning glacier. I thought a good place for palm frost monitoring. But this site has a very high heat flow. Like one meter below ground is uh, about 10 degrees C. And that's one reason that usually people talk about palm uh, glacier melting from top to down. But maybe this area, possibly some of the glacier melting slowly from bottom to up because of high geothermal. You can, maybe this is annual layer, you can see that it's not parallel to the ground. I mean, maybe this area is more melting faster. So then you can see the point of this is a uh, thermal camera. You can look at this and you can see this is a uh, visible light. You can see the crater here, same, same thing. So evening, dark time, I go there back again to take the thermal camera. You can see the climate, very hot spot. So yeah, I can put in the temperature about the network of 40 degrees. See? So that the many places has a uh, very hot uh, heat flow come up to the surface. And this is a, one of the spots about the uh, uh, white ash layer, typically good for the solar radiation, albedo is good for permafrost development, but the uh, reality is many, many heat sources came from. Into the only 15 minutes, I'll just uh, make a little on this. Then another thing is a very important thing. I think this is a, a, actually later we, we want to discuss a little more about the uh, mana care. But uh, uh, this is a uh, when snow cover. That's uh, where the snow cover and uh, permafrost development is very close to uh, connect with the tropical mountain because uh, again snow cover is a great uh, uh, example for the solar radiation cut off to the ground. Then ground maintain the cold as on zero degrees C. The evening te temperature drop down, they penetrate to the ground and end up the annual average temperature going below zero. And the most important, the longest snow cover, we have a permafrost in Kilimanjaro. Then shortest, you know, when you look at the Landsat, to the changing the snowfall, then where, where is the snow is fast melting, uh, where is the exposed ground? That's different, but we have about uh, eight drill sites in the summit of the Kilimanjaro. And we look at the snow cover condition. Long as the snow cover area has a permafrost, the short as the snow cover area has no permafrost. <coughs> so that, that's actually variation of the geothermal, you know, hot temperatures almost 20 degrees C, then permafrost area is 0 degrees C. A thick uh, Kilimanjaro uh, uh, three meter depth uh, profile. Stay almost zero degree C. So that's actually very similar. This is a moon, you know. This is a 1960s Apollo uh, project time. Uh, they drill holes about three meter. Yeah, two point five meter. We made the temperature. That Apollo, I think, is uh, Apollo 15 and 17 time. Uh, you can plot it like. Uh, uh, when the sun hit more than 100 degrees C, when the sun down uh, almost crossed the minus 200 C, very big uh, temperature variation because no atmosphere, but uh, it doesn't draw much uh, penetrate to the ground. 50 centimeters below is almost the same, about minus 20. So, kind of, you know, Kilimanjaro is similar, but of course not that extreme like a moon, but the uh, uh, air is uh, half of this here, so then there's not much. Uh, Heat transfer the ground and the atmosphere end up once the sun hit very hot in summer, like 50 degrees C on sun hit, the sun down minus 10, move around like 60 degree one day, it move around every day. So that's Kilimanjaro surface conditions. So that's just a summary about Kilimanjaro. Uh, yeah, this is a very, very high geothermal flow. Let's consider our compost distribution. 
And also, uh, high solar radiation. This is the highest, like, three degree south, much stronger than Hawaii. So then, uh, albedo helps us a lot to stay in the cooler. Meaning, snow cover is very important, or thinning glacier is important. That's the uh, key of the distribution of the permafrost at Kilimanjaro. Then, uh, how about Hawaii? How about the second? Hawaii is, uh, you know, we're almost 20 degrees north. I mean, uh, kind of quite a bit far from the equator. So then, uh, 60s or uh, early 70s, you know, uh, would go to Doyle Hall to the several spot for the uh, northern face, of, north facing slope of the summit crater that we found the palm cross. So, but uh, again, uh, this is a very, very unique place to be like, uh, developing power cross because, uh, uh, remember, very area, if we check the lapse rate, 4,300 is supposed to not have power cross time. We need about 5,000 in this strategy. But uh, we have power cross that time. So that uh, very special. For example, this is uh, yesterday we took the picture of the thermal camera and the dogs in the palm cross set. He's near his borehole site. He's still, you know, we can have uh, uh, very strong convection, air convection in the uh, between the rocks because rocks are big. There are lots of pore space. Then the uh, summertime they can easy to block the solar radiation. Then there is cavity underneath. The winter time, this time of the year, if a cold air can easy to flow. The hot air the inside can uh, escape using this pore space. So that that's very typically. Uh, May naturally maintain the permafrost. That is uh, like uh, most of the rock glacier for the warm area of the Alaska, has the same things. And also, we usually artificially making this for the lower embankment. Like in Alaska, we have a lot of ice ridge permafrost. If we make a road, start the permafrost line, we make an embankment like that's uh, big stones that makes permafrost develop. The end of permafrost table is rise. And still keep cool in the road, the road is this shape. That's very typically we use it. The same technique we introduced for Chinese government to the you know, Tibet, Lhasa railway, we use the same method to the, keep the pump cross cooler. So, the, anyways, the, this is a, a small area, but the Manaki has the same mechanism exists there. Then, this is a still, you know, we try to figure out, then hopefully, next year. We can work a little more better result to show you to you know not like today but uh, yeah this is a 1970s a lot of uh, measurement of permafrost about uh, 11 meter thickness of permafrost ice ice bonded permafrost exists in the 70s at Mauna Kea then this is very rapid you know we just get a new sensor here but uh, definitely the warming than the 70s. But the presence of permafrost, the absence of permafrost, as it's still early to say uh, something result. Yet. Hopefully next year we can say a little more exact. But uh, at least at this stage we can say that it is different. It is warming. So then how much warming, how it looks like, we hopefully we can see you next year to a little more explain about this. But uh, that's current state of the uh, Mauna Kea conditions, quite a bit warmer than the 70s. So that's uh, <clears throat> that, yeah. Then also, you know, uh, the area that not directly connects to the permafrost, but also we have a very much uh, free source cycle in Hawaii, very strongly almost every day in the winter time. It, uh, temperature, ground temperature crossing the zero, positive and negative, continue to. Changing, which is, makes the free soil cycle is very active. They end up that stripes are still very commonly you can see in the Banda Kea. But uh, again, this is just a free soil cycle issue, not the permafrost directly related. So then, actually, yesterday uh, morning, we see the, the needle ice, that, uh, that's very much the main mechanism of the free soil cycle, they end up the salted ground. So then, just uh, quickly, the uh, north of the mountain here. Yeah, we we are uh, compared to other high mountain permafrost. Mountain here is actually not high enough for typically uh, presence of permafrost, but it it, it is permafrost there and uh, would confirm it. 
So that there must be very special like slope aspects or greater topography, many uh, local issues, very critical but very interesting, but also must be very vulnerable condition there. So, <coughs> much time. And then just a quickly, yes, maybe uh, slow, uh, I think I explained about uh, uh, Peru. Peru is about uh, 16 degrees south. Kind of, you know, similar uh, here. Um, here, 90 degrees north, but there is 16 degrees south. Then we have a nice area, we have a uh, inactive volcano, Tatani, and active volcano, uh, Misty, that we can have a chance to measure that uh, same height and how different it is. Then this is the example that Chachan is a 5,350 meter temperature profile. You can see that that's much colder than Kilimanjaro, much colder than uh, Woodcock times Hawaii, like minus uh, 0.4 degrees C, about temperature of that, about until 4 meter depth. So then uh, again, here yeah, at Hawaii, we have a salted ground. The stripes, you can see, it's pretty slow cycle, is very active, like right? typical tropical palm frost area. Then this is the Karapuna and the other area. There, I'm really focusing on the how, how much impact was snow cover. Of course, when you have a snow, very strong soil radiation, you have a, like, say, you know, uh, snows uh, more positive like this, and, and penitent, what uh, happening like this, right? So for the directly the, uh, to the edge of the atmosphere. So the, this is a site about uh, how it looks like the uh, Peru. Temperature almost stays uh, zero degrees C for about uh, uh, three meter depths. But uh, 50 centimeter depths, you have a summertime reach to the uh, two degrees C, but uh, most of the maintenance is zero for the rest of the time because these areas are quite a bit snow. I mean, uh, how much snow affects for the permafrost? You can see that uh, most of the time we can have a zero or a negative. Then some no snow season we have positive temperature, but uh, compared to both, both positive and negative, and the balance end up negative, we can have a permafrost. So that's very much Peru. And the uh, important for Peru so far we understand the temperature, albedo is very important. Then most of the area actually. Uh, uh, ice bonded palm frost, that's maybe that came from a uh, little ice age time. Then, Joe Salmon Cross, same thing is very important. So, the binary, so the only one is just Mexico, that's kind of same, same situations. It's 90 degrees, very similar, Hawaii and Mexico, same uh, almost latitude. Then, there is a, uh, about 70 kilometers east of Mexico City, we have a two volcano. Uh, Popo Capital and uh, uh, Istasugua there. Then this active volcano just erupted uh, this year. Then this one has a no inactive volcano with a pump cross there. Then we have set the uh, sensor of this to set up the end of the, in, in Mexico. This time also is very close to the limit of the elevation. Then we see the pump cross, but uh, we, the problem is that we may see so that this is a very glacier ice. Sometimes, you know, there is a big glacier ice in this area. Then some of the remaining glacier ice covered by the debris, then maybe ash, then we drill it through, then we measure temperature, stay zero because of the latent heat. They still have a, you know, a lot of latent heat, to the, all the ice disappear. So that, that's what we may measure. That I still feel like not really comfortable about the Mexico case. I, not about 4,800 meter point, we have come across see it, but maybe that just a debris covered glacier. So that's just very much summary today. Uh, so that the common characteristic for these regions, that we are just introduced the four regions. Uh, Mexico and Hawaii and the Peru and the Kilimanjaro, all the in general the volcano. So that it means what? The volcano means we have a crater. The crater means the ideal storage of cold air it doesn't go anywhere. I mean, that if we can have a relatively micro topographically cool cold air can hold it, this. That's good for permafrost development. Now also, volcano means usually we have a tephra, the ash layer. 
the ASHE layer has a usually the lower thermal conductivity, which is good to, if something cold material covered by ash, you can freeze up nicely. They also, most of the time, higher albedo, which is good for uh, tephra. That end up that, you know, surface offset makes it smaller. So then, uh, another thing is a glacial snow that protects the strong solar radiation. We, we see that in case of Peru or Kilimanjaro, you see that maybe the mana here has the same situation possible. So that, you know, that helps a lot for maintaining the power process. Then, uh, last one, that, yeah, the, most of the uh, permafrost main uh, pandas are very ice rich. Now, when you look at the stable isotope, all the numbers are almost the same. That means something is, can be even to go in the water, go into the soil layer, the pore space, immediately freeze. Then, what do we can do this? This kind of condition. You know, we need maybe three or more colders on today's conditions to develop this. And then the one idea is maybe little ice age to uh, put in the water go to freeze. Then we preserve system because, you know, so many ice in the ground, we need uh, so many heat to the all throw out. You know, a lot of heat, uh, latent heat required to disappear this ice. That means that possibly the most of the permafrost today in the tropical areas are they lift the permafrost, not active today, that's possible too. That, that energy, uh, it, it rises is a major driver to develop the tropical permafrost. That's possible too. That's still, we need to understand the origin of the ice, origin of the uh, structure of the permafrost. That, that's still, we are working on this. Uh, so then end up the kind of uh, against the pump cross maintenance, uh, we, we almost all the areas the higher geothermal flow, that means that we always high changes the, especially the, for example, Kilimanjaro problem is they change very actively. And uh, we have a very cold area there, but uh, several years later, this area has a very heat flow higher and change the other space. That, that makes it a little difficult for us to understand. Anyway, thank you very much for uh, listening today. I hope you understand my English terrible and also terrible things I speak still too fast. Then hopefully you understand then. Uh, any questions, this is my email address. Then uh, Aria, the please tell me uh, tell you about uh, this book. Uh, electronic version is uh, this uh, address. You can go there, then you can see that all the information about Pamfros. Then we have a uh, blog about the English and Russian side there. Then hopefully uh, something benefit for you. Yeah. Thank you very much. At the beginning you were defining permafrost, and as I understood it, you said that bedrock below, with an average temperature below freezing, even though it's impervious, is permafrost? Yeah, the locks, uh, any ground material cold as on zero degree C will go permafrost, yes. But frost has something to do with water, doesn't it? What? Frost doesn't have something to do with water? No. The, the temperature, uh, the phase of the temperature is like zero degree C or colder. That, that means that we don't, like the permafrost definition is uh, cold, uh, any ground material cold as on zero degree C more than two years, period. So that means that, yeah, we have a very good, maybe the even bedrock has a 0, 0.0 some percent of water in there, but the, even bedrock, they have uh, negative temperature, because power plus. One other question. Um, on my there are, you know, a pair of glacial features, you, you touched on pattern ground, there's solar fluxion, Is the solar fluxion active? I don't know. But um, uh, pattern ground has to do with freeze thaw and uh, sorting by ice needles and so on. Is there any relationship? If, if you have permafrost, you have impervious substrate. So maybe one or two more in above permafrost in the melting zone than in the area above permafrost. Is there a relationship between pattern ground? Yeah, it, it, exactly. Yeah, you know, most of the pattern ground, you need moisture, the water. Especially
the bottom of the plate that you see a lot of salted polygon there, that's, you know, you need a quite a bit of the uh, involution required to develop this. And you need a lot, almost saturated condition all the time. How do you make a saturated condition on the, the situation? They ideally come across there as nicer, but in case of this, you know, manner here, you couldn't could confirm the power growth that all these, you know, polygons or stripes, no power growth under this. I mean, uh, of course, you know, ideally, water holding but the power growth, but uh, not necessary to power growth to control this. What's the chance of uh, they were losing the permafrost condition. The chance of the where after mana here? I, I think you know like simply when you look at the lapse rate, mana is already not high enough to have a stable permafrost conditions. Like air temperature already average summit area the air temperature like plus one or two. So that means a very little to holding permafrost. The only chance to the pump of develop, the, I believe, the snow cover. But you know, if the thicker snow cover get us isolated, no good. The thin snow cover, thin enough to the nighttime atmosphere temperature penetrate to the ground. That can be conditions great to have it. Then also another thing is like uh, at least when we read about the Woodcox uh, paper, a lot of uh, ice bonded, many ice in the between the poor space for the manakeat case. So that means very uh, climated resistance because you know you need a lot of heat to take out all the ice out. Uh, that means you, you can't change too much. I mean the different meaning in your question about how we, we do this. If we have a lot of ice, uh, like uh, ice from high ice content in palm frost, you can have a more stable to exist power cross. If the low ice content, maybe just a little changing immediately gone, something like this. So that then today we try to understand about the, his site, about mana care. It is the ice is not uh, as much as high when he, he mentioned. That may, maybe more vulnerable today for that by the climate. I have two questions. One, I don't believe the area that you showed on my hair as having come across was near the Lake Wyatt. Okay, the passage uh, we, Yeah, the place that uh, <laughs> Dr. Woodcock found it was in Pukuvaki, which is, yeah, not near Lake Wyatt. It's a different crater. Lake Wyatt is. Oh, Lake Wyatt. Right, yeah, so, I, I, I agree. I don't, I don't show today Lake Wyatt. I'm talking about. Uh, Summit, what to them the summit? Pukuvaku. Huh? Pukuvaku. Yeah. That, that, uh, but even Pukuvaku, I'm questioned today. It's much warmer. Maybe we, we may not have Pampros anymore, even. Entire month. But we don't, too hard to say something like this. We need a more detailed examination, then we can say, maybe then, hopefully next year, we can a little more talk about. But uh, deep into the lake, even 60s, I don't think Pampros, no. That's my. Uh, Thinking about the only the summit that only. Yeah, because it, it has been thought, or some people have thought that the retention of the water in the Yeah, I saw the some guidebook, uh, something say palm frost. Yeah. I don't think so yeah. at all. Yeah, no, no palm frost. That's very difficult to have palm frost in that condition. And the second question I had is uh, Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa are essentially the same altitude, and yet in your prediction, you predicted that Mauna Kea would have. Permafrost and monolo would not. What is the difference? Uh, uh, that, that's actually a good question. So, first thing is that I say that both no permafrost. It's not high enough. First things, you know, if Mauna Kea, Mauna Loa, both 5,000 meter high, we will have permafrost, yes. But uh, both not that high, but you need uh, something really special situations. The first thing is that uh, Mauna Loa has maybe more geothermal flow than Mauna Kea. That means a kind of weakness for developed power frost. Then albedo issue, Mauna Loa is more lower albedo than Mauna Kea. That's weak for Mauna Loa. Then the other thing is the crater system does not have a like, small cinder cone in the Mauna Loa. That means the local topography is a weakness for Mauna Loa. Then finally, uh, the 
even the Woodcock mentioned, I, I also see that many times for the convection issue. You can have a convection dock, not but that kind of material in Mauna Loa. So that when the Mauna here has more ideal situations to have a permafrost, if possible. But again, both mountains is not high enough to have a typically have everywhere. That means you have to really spot point possibly have, maybe possibly not have that situation. Uh, Mauna Loa does have ice caves, yeah. perpetual ice. Right. Is that just like a subsurface glacier that's not permafrost? Yeah, that, that's you know, hard point. You know, like remember that first is uh, permafrost is a uh, division of the ground material stayed frozen more than two years. So ice cave, the ice is precipitation penetrated to the cave. Then you know, night, uh, winter time or cold time. Develop the water changes the ice. So then summertime or daytime, not hot enough to melt out this ice. That's why do you see the ice today. So that means we don't call the passing the material is not the ground material originally. So that means we don't see the permafrost, then we don't tell that, that ice cave the ice is not the permafrost. But if some reason surround the ice cave says lava lava has a Temperature bit zero or colder than zero degrees C, we sell palm process. So then the point of it, you see a lot of ice cave in the France or Spain or in Canary Island or you know like New Mexico. That that's ice cave. We don't sell palm process. The same Mala Loa ice cave is the same category of the like Canary Island, Spain, or New Mexico ice cave. And I believe the glaciers are receding very rapidly in Kilimanjaro. Right. And do you expect the permafrost to follow that to the way? Yeah, that, that I try to follow the anything uh, literating glacier spot, I do really to understand the ground condition there. Even the, one of the projects we try to do is uh, still glacier on there, we go through the glacier to monitor the ground temperature, how changing that disappear. But still, we don't quite success for this. One of the reasons, uh, like two years ago, we drilled next to the just the literating glacier, but that's an accidentally high geothermal location. <laughs> it's too hot, then no power cross there, then we kind of disappointed. Yeah, but, yeah. But I want to thank uh, John Coney and uh, Mariana Takamiya with the Department of Astronomy and Physics here at UH Evo for making the arrangements and making this happen today. It. And uh, otherwise, thank you very much.